Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, Iris Shirishi combines traditional Japanese rhythms with Western influences in her taiko drum compositions for the Mu Daiko Drum Ensemble. Tana Schrunk creates unexpected visual effects with lustrous materials like wood veneer, brushed aluminum, and even concrete. And Paraguayan harpist Nicholas Carter performs Crossing the Isthmus, inspired by his bicycle trip through Central America. These artists and more now on Minnesota Original. is a taiko drumming ensemble using Japanese traditional drums, kind of putting together the traditional rhythms that come to us, but also because of who we are and where we are, these North American rhythms. Um, so it, we have influences coming from rock and from jazz, even of classical music background of the Bartok and the Stravinsky and those really driving rhythms that you hear and putting it all together in this package. Yeah, yeah, I like it like that. Does anyone try again? I do. Okay. I attended the University of Hawaii and I received a degree in composition there. I went on to graduate school at the University of Iowa, and degrees in composition and in arts administration. Went back to school at the U of M for a degree in music therapy. So I have a pretty checkered past. I've only been the artistic director for a couple of years. I've been playing with Mudaiko for 15. I um, mean, I just started as a student and I started as a player. I uh, gradually um, began to teach more, uh, was able to um, kind of step up a little bit more to the leadership. And then in these last um, couple of years, really starting to get this total picture of what it means to guide all of these really talented players into a, you know, a different place. See, I told you. Composers never can play their piece. Right. Yeah, <laughs> really. Taiko in general just means big drum in Japanese. And it can refer both to the drums and to the style of drumming. The repertoire of drums that we have in our studio range from our big um, three-foot odaiko. Whenever you put an O in front of a word, it is an honorific. So it's always the largest drum on the floor is um, with, with the O in front of it. So the O daiko is three feet. Down to maybe a little bit over two feet, the chu daiko or medium drum. And that's probably the, the size drum that we have the most in our studio. We have shime daiko and shime are the small bound or tied drums, which are the timekeepers of the group. We play the drums with a wide variety of drumsticks. We call bachi, and it kind of matches the drums. So it's, it's whatever you need to do to pull the best rounded sound out of the drum. The way that we all train with taiko is that we don't have written music at all. You learn through the system of kuchi shoka. Kuchi is mouth and shoka is notes in Japanese and you learn it line by line. It's just brute memorization. The sounds, the kuchi shoka that we make, most of them are related to a specific drum, but it's most, more size than anything. So whenever we play our big drums down to the medium-sized drums, or any of those barrel-shaped drums, we will tend to use or say like don or doko. So don, doko, don, doko, don, doko. Teke, 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 teke,
It's meant to somewhat mimic the sound, so tensk, 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 ten, ten, ten. We find that when you say it, the likelihood of your playing it correctly is you just have a higher percentage, higher batting average for that. Um, so we always go through this procedure of saying the kuchishoka. And then ha. Choreography for Mudaiko has always been very, very important. Um, big, expansive movements um, so that the movement matches the sound that comes out. That fluidity within form and power is an important aspect of any of the Taiko compositions we do. Bachi goes up, you connect, you put your energy, your whole body into the sound, it goes out into the audience to your listeners and then hopefully it comes back to you. Voyage of the Star started off, I think, because I was getting my usual homesickness for Hawaii. <laughs> and so that's where I started to think about the Hawaiian chant music, which I just love. Um, that's where um, some of the melodies come from, which we actually end up playing on Japanese flute. Thousands of years ago, Tahitians traveled up to Hawaii to settle the islands. Using this one star called the Hokulea, they uh, figured out how to navigate just using the stars. And then I started to imagine what that trip was all about. To be on that canoe with just whatever food and water they could pack at the mercy of the ocean and the weather and the wind and the stars, you know, guiding you. And then coming up to first landfall after probably days or weeks at sea and what that would feel like. I don't know whether or not I've captured that. You know, in the piece, I always am never ever satisfied with what I come out with, but even if I get a little bit of that flavor, I will feel a teeny bit satisfied. <laughs> All of the verbals are pretty unscripted. Sometimes they can be. Sometimes people use it for timing, though we don't tend to use it in performance for timing, but we do use it as encouragement. But they're a really important part of taiko. So if you ever go to a taiko performance and you don't hear that, something's wrong. <laughs> taiko drumming is the best combination of music, of rhythm, of choreography, of movement, um, excitement, connection uh, with each other, with the audience, with the community. The continuing challenge for me as a performer is to always not be afraid to show what's on the inside. To figure out, well, what does it take for me to get out of my little shell of this body and give everything that I have? And part of it is trying to be really honest and authentic within the moment. And there are some moments, I can count on one hand, where I really feel like I have transcended my own insecurities and myself and just be there, you know, and just really embody the rhythms that are coming out. Well, that was curious. Oh, it's a little crazy, but you know. Don't, 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 don't.
when I first started working with veneers, I was actually doing wooden boats. And I had some inlay that I wanted to do, and I chose Avo de Ray, which is very, very lustrous. And after I'd done some of the work on one of the boats, I had some of this Avo de Ray veneer left over. So I cut some squares, and I put together an assembly, and it looked fairly nice, but I had tape all over it. I flipped it upside down, and I put it by the window and looked at it. One area was really much brighter than another. I stepped a couple of steps over to the side and the light just totally changed. And it was really a eureka moment. I'm Thomas R. Schrunk. I'm an artist in lustrous materials. Most materials, when, when the light strikes them, uh, the light is bounced off in more or less a uniform 180 degree hemisphere. Lustrous materials have something in the surface or in the, the actual material itself that causes the light to be bounced off, not in a uniform way, but directionally, more in one direction than another. Wood uh, has a cellular uh, structure that actually acts as lenses and gives a special light. The veneers are thin pieces of wood that are sliced from a log. Uh, they have a grain. The direction of the grain will have a, a strong effect on the amount of light that it gives off. In one direction, it will be very bright. You rotate it 90 degrees and it will be dark. You can see the differential in the light uh, and how it responds to the light. And that the light is the subject matter of, of what I do. I had an engraving company and I engraved brass nameplates and aluminum nameplates. And at one point, I had the stack of, let's say, 30 brass plates, and accidentally I knocked them over. And they spread out like a fan. And the lighting on those was so completely different. And it was gradated from one to the next. Voila, there it was, a new medium. The aluminum as a medium is much brighter than uh, wood cells. Wood cells are not straight, they, are, they curve around, they're tapered at each end. With brushed metals, because those lines are mechanically induced, they're very straight, they're very precise, and they're very bright when they're at the right angle. You can get an idea of the difference in uh, luminosity. Uh, by changing the uh, angle so that the brushing, here it's the same, and you can see it stays the same. This is the difference that you're able to get by taking advantage of that, that change. The brushing of the aluminum is at different angles so that as you turn it, the various uh, angles uh, light up and uh, decrease in brightness. be successful as an artist, uh, you must be curious. The thing that I love about doing uh, work with lustrous materials is it's always a surprise. One has a hard time thinking of luster and brightness when one thinks of concrete. I was sort of like Thomas Edison with the light bulb. I tried everything under the sun, and I finally came up with a method of putting ridges and grooves in the concrete surface. From one angle, you're seeing the lit side of those grooves, and you move to the other side, you see the shadow side. When you're used to seeing something that reacts in a very normal way, you pay no attention to it. When you have something that is different, that, that uh, 
uh, gives off a different uh, aura. You look at things differently, and that's, I think, one of the purposes of, of art. Uh, it is to look at the world differently. large paintings with a lot of squares for years and often questioning myself thinking you know maybe there's something wrong with me mentally that <laughs> I do this over and over. My paintings are defined by labor intensity, repetition and very luscious uh, luminous surfaces. My name is Barbara Kraft I was born in Germany, but I've been living here for over 30 years. I achieve a luminous surface by working with a medium and by using or applying many layers of paint. A lot of pigment is very transparent. Most of them are. And if you have just one application, it's, you know, sort of thin. And I found that if I put layer after layer out, I get very luminous surfaces that kind of move in and out, and I really enjoy that. I was a figurative painter for a long time. In 94, I, I took my first trip to India, and I was struck by the repetitive nature of images of gods and goddesses and people repeating like mantras or there was a sameness there that was appealing to me and I realized how tired I was of consuming always the new or consuming everything so when I came back I dropped all uh, distraction I became very quiet and I emptied my paintings of story because I was perhaps tired of the human drama I felt I wanted to paint on a different level and to add quietness to the world. Something that is, has no story or that suggests that there are bigger things out there than us. And that's also why I picked this square because it does not have any significance. It does not represent anything. To me, it's important that even though this is geometry using a square, that it never reads mechanical. It's completely organic. So right now, I'm trying to put a lot of this color down, but also in a way that it's not uh, predictable. So I have to constantly check myself in order to not repeat the same pattern. That, that's why I sometimes just go someplace else and put one. But the point is not to have predictable patterns. And then, you know, once I'm done, I go over this whole painting again and <laughs> fine tune it. In an average, I spent three months on a work, sometimes more. I have one painting that took me a year. I buy paint sometimes because I like the name. So I bought Caesar's Purple, Mineral Violet was very intriguing to me, Byzantine Blue, I like those names. In the summer I, I camp. This time I, I took photos of um, water. I got intrigued by reflections. For instance, this is actually a part of the Mississippi and I was out of color ink, but this is how I actually started. I like the, all those blue stripes that you see. I mean, the mistakes that come up when you don't have 
accurate printing going on. So I began this painting by um, referring to this regular pattern of blue stripes. I'm not used to working with a drama of light and dark. I don't really want that. My previous work is very all over and contemplative, so you get lost in this all over space and your eye does not rest anywhere. So for me to deal with this moving from light to dark, I could not solve it for myself peacefully. So I, I eventually add, uh, ended up by unifying it all with that same color. And it's again a mixture of very rigid and controlled and, and very organic. I'm very dedicated in a sense that I don't ever put my painting second. It's my favorite thing to do. It's so engaging to paint. And I'm always dying to see the next painting. I can't wait. <laughs> the song Crossing the Isthmus was inspired by a, a bicycle trip uh, I did in 1987 from San Diego to Panama. And so the song is sort of, you know, the a memory of being out and rolling and rolling and rolling in the tough hills and the sun burning and the rain falling on me and all those beautiful things of being in the outdoors and traveling at the pace the, what a bicycle can offer.
the song for me, it reminds me of that, of that journey. It was such a strong impact on, on my life, being outside for so long, for so many days, and then being physically challenged every day. Uh, the, you, you're impregnated with the smells and the sounds and the people you see, and, and they, it's a very vivid memory, that journey. Sometimes we'd, we'd camp out. Uh, sometimes uh, I'd find a, a cheap hotel. I, I was kind of like on a, on a $10 a day budget. Sometimes people took us in, into their homes and we found, you know, a barn with rats one night to sleep in. And uh, sometimes it was on a, we bought a hammock in the Yucatan Peninsula and slept on hammocks. And it was unpredictable what would happen. We never knew what the next day would bring. Uh, it was just uh, incredible. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.